Well, we'll begin this evening uh, with a topic that I, you know, I come up with topics, and I come up with classes, and sometimes it's one of those things that's just like, we've got to teach this, and that's where this one came from, what I call the real down and dirty survival cooking life lifestyle, and what it could actually be like, and what you might have to do to adapt, and really this is all about just adapting is the bottom line, each one of us adapting to our circumstances. As as always, you know, we take a look at our wonderful lifestyle that we've had in this country. You know, you turn the tap, you flip the switch, and you go to the store, everything. is. You know, we live this incredible lifestyle, and we have for, actually for most people for generations in this country, we have been blessed. And because of that, we make assumptions about how things may in fact work. Well, reality is this. What you may have assumed, or what you've been taught about how you might be cooking or fixing your meals, when things get really, really tough, quite frankly, is wrong. It, it's not wrong in the sense that somebody's trying to lie to you, but it's wrong in the sense that it's very incomplete. And the bottom line is this. You see, <clears throat> when it does come to these long-term situations, and let's say the grid's been down. When the grid goes down, power grid, everything else starts turning off, and most people will be without any services whatsoever, including the ability to pump gasoline and, and travel as well as electricity, water, sewer, a lot of these things are going to be out. So when it's been off for a period of time, conventional instructions and things that we're kind of used to, they simply do not apply. They, they have no relevance to that situation. And there's many nice sounding ideas that are being passed around out there, and there's people writing books, but they're doing it from a lifestyle, and it's from a perspective in their lifestyle where utilities are always close at hand, and they're never gone for very long. And you see, that sets you up because you can say, well, I'm going to turn everything off here for a day or so and play with it. But you know that it's coming back. So emotionally and mentally, it's very, very different. You see, most of the time we lose our power and our uh, utilities for uh, just a few days at most. The infrastructure is restored. Even when there's great damage in an area in here, it might go for a week or so. We see that, people without power. Uh, but the other thing is uh, you can escape. It's just no issue. You can say, well, I'm just going to go to a better place. I'm going to evacuate. I'm going to get out of here. And there's always help at hand, and assistance will come to you if for some reason you're not able to go. And we just kind of know that. And so it has a very different mentality when you're trying to just play with these things. These people are well-intentioned, and we're all well-intentioned in this. Again, there's no conspiracy in this. And a lot of them are providing recipes, and we call them the preparedness recipes, and there's lots of tips and hints about what you can do. But here again, they don't have any real point of reference because they've never lived it, never really lived it for any period of time. Uh, they've been without utilities or they may turn them off for a little while. Or you may ever, most people have been perhaps camping for a little while, but it's for short periods. And what kind of it comes down to is there's this light at the end of the tunnel. You know that it's coming back. You know you're gonna restore your utilities. You're gonna go back to a place where they are. So here again, mentally and emotionally, it's very, very different. And few people can even imagine what long-term loss of services and, and utilities would be and the inability to resupply at will. You see, we've had this wonderful, opulent lifestyle in this country for generations. We're wonderfully blessed. I enjoy it. I hope it never goes away. The utilities always come back, and usually it's very quickly. Even when there's uh, extensive damage, it's back within a few days, within a few weeks. And the physical, mental, emotional dependence that most people have developed, in other words, they've become entitled to have these things. In fact, if the power goes out, for, uh, this happened down in our valley a little while back, the power was out for, I don't know, four or five hours. Uh, we live in a place where it's less reliable than others. And there were businesses that were thinking they were going to sue the power company because, you know, their registers didn't work and they couldn't take sales and those kinds of things. And so they're going to sue the power company because there was a lightning storm. There was a blizzard or something like that. We have become so used to having these things, we cannot imagine what it's like to not have them. Now, in order to thrive, and when I say thrive, this is not just getting by, just surviving. During an extended period where there's a shutdown, you're going to have to come at these things with a very different set of attitudes. Your expectations will have to be different. In fact, your skills, the functional skills, the things you do, 
The things that you know that you can do will be different. The personal commitments that you have to go through these things and the internal and external resilience that you are able to put forth, not just as a mask, but as just who you are. You see, and all of these things have to be properly rooted in principles. And what's extremely important about learning these things, doing these things, practicing these things, is you do it now. You play with these things now. Because if you don't do them now, if you don't develop them now, if you don't develop the characteristics, the resilience, and those kinds of things we're talking about, you find yourself struggling in the moment, and there can be lots of suffering. And there can be a doubtful future for you. Because you're dependent on others and other things, and self-reliance it just isn't there, and you become a victim of the events. And we talk about the being a victim of what's happened. That's not a pleasant place to be. It's also very dangerous if people cannot be there to be of assistance. Well, you'll need to develop. And I'm going to say not just develop, but regularly practice what I've kind of come to call the slam, bam, down and dirty, shoot from the hip, practical meal planning and preparation. Now, when things break and go away for a few days, maybe even for a few weeks, maybe even for a couple of three months, you know, you can go on kind of momentum and you can go on the sort of a standard way of doing things. And we have a tendency to want to use up our, our best first and our easiest first and those kinds of things. That's why I say, let's look out about six months. The utilities have been gone. Your ability to travel have been gone. And by the way, I'm not in favor of those things in, uh, occurring. And those of you who know me is I'm not a gloom and doom kind of a guy. And I look at worst case scenarios because my he by heck, if you're prepared for the worst, then you'll be okay. And if you're not prepared for it and it happens, you've got a big problem. So I'd like to look at the worst case and think in terms of what would I do and then practice solving those issues. And this is what occurred to me a few days back because I've been reading books and I'm watching videos and I'm listening to people. And all of a sudden it, it dawned on me, and this was partially true because of what we went through up at Snow College up there, which was a very extreme when that blizzard hit, and how it changes your life and your lifestyle. And if you're not prepared with the both the attitude and the ability to deal with it and be okay, it now becomes threatening, not necessarily because it's physically threatening, but because psychologically it's threatening and then you do dumb things. Now, by the way, I discovered as I started doing this, this is the hardest webcast to put together I've ever done. Uh, it, as I, I could not find a way to begin this thing easily. I, I know what needs to be done. As a matter of fact, the webcast is because of what I'm going to be doing on this Saturday. This Saturday I'll be doing a demonstration of these things, talking about these same principles, and then just show people how to do it. The problem is it's not about physical things. It's, it's not about a list of stuff. And it's not about a lot of things that are easy to quantify. You see, it's about living outside of the cookbook. Now, the cookbook literally, in terms of this is how you make a meal, that's a cookbook. But it's also life by the cookbook method. And very often, it's easy to live by the cookbook method because this is what you always do. Here's the recipe to take care of things, fix things, do things. And so we live by the recipe. We live by the cookbook. And a lot of people are very dependent, I've found, on a recipe book. I mean, if they're even cooking from what you might call scratch, they're going to go down the list and do exactly what that cookbook says. And you don't want to be living your life that way or cooking that way because what happens if you don't have a cookbook? What happens if something is really broken and you've lost things or you've had to leave You've had to abandon your cookbook or your stuff. And that's why I talk about things the way that I do from a principal base. And you see, it's about who you are. And, and it's, it's not about what you own so much, but it's what's inside of you. And it's your ability to think. It's your ability to adapt. So for long-term grid-down nutrition, you'll have to come at this situation with a whole new set of attitudes, an entirely different perspective, and a commitment along the lines perhaps you have never made before because you haven't had to. The bottom line is we have lived very comfortably, but how do you project into that future and be okay no matter what? You see, if you don't have the right attitudes, perspective, and commitment, then failure is guaranteed. Now, failure can mean a lot of things. It can just mean pain and suffering and misery. It can also mean injury and death. Uh, it can mean that you give up your freedoms or different things like this because you just can't stay and do what you have to do. 
Well, for true survival nutrition, there are three main things that must be satisfied. They are this, your personal survival be attitudes, the true needs of the body, and then there's some basic tools and some skills and some materials and things. But it's really in this order of priority from your personal survival be attitudes. Now, I talk about these things periodically, and I was trying to not repeat some things here, but I have to because it's just the way that it actually is. In lack of any one of these, you become a victim and you're hoping that somebody will come rescue your hiney. And if they don't come rescue it, you could be in big, big trouble is what it comes down to. Well, let's talk about your personal beatitudes. And, and these are the survival principles that are so critical. I like to find different ways of, de of describing those things and helping people understand them. <clears throat> because you see, this is the single most important thing for your survival. And this is universal. We're not just talking about cooking and fixing meals here, quite frankly. Now, you can learn more about these in other places, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here, but number one, attitude is the top of the list. Attitude equals L or D. You know, how are you, how you emotionally respond or react to what's going on around you. That's the definition of attitude, how you emotionally respond or react. Realize there's a big difference between respond and react to what's going on around you, especially when things are completely out of your control. A, attitude, L, life, D, death. You see, when you lose your attitude, when things are really, really bad, you can lose your life. That's not a pleasant thought, but it's a reality because we see that demonstrated regularly. You read about it in books. You'll see it on the news. People lose their attitude and they opt out. You must develop a survival attitude, and there's classes to help you with this. There's one that's on the website you can uh, watch for free at any time, time, Foundation Class 1001, Prepare to Survive No Matter What. Foundation Class 1101, Core Principles for Self-Reliant Living, more in-depth. Foundation Class 1105, the foundation library you must own, study, and internalize. We'll be doing that class in the not-too-distant future. Another Foundation Class 1205, which is Surviving Against All Odds. Those are all about developing an attitude of making it no matter what. Well, you have to obtain and study an attitude library. And people have been here before, you've heard these before, but I'm going to make this statement. These four books, these three that I see right here, and you add in this one more that is a, a strategy book, but it feeds into attitude to help you develop an attitude. If you're unwilling to read, no, not read, study those books and reread them, then as far as I'm concerned, maybe I'm being rude, but as far as I'm concerned, you're not really serious about being prepared to deal with things. Some of the things in these books are a little hard. Some of it's a little, you know, glad I don't have to go through that, and so am I. But it's worth studying because what you'll find from these books is it's all an attitude. All the things that go into building your attitude. And by the way, you do have to have material things. You have to take the right actions. And there's other wonderful books also. When we do the Foundation Library, I'll give you a review of a lot of other books. You see, when it gets really bad, if you do not have a firm spiritual foundation and lose your attitude, you simply give up, you quit, you do something dumb, you end up dead. Well, that's what we want to avoid. Develop and leave, live each day by these key personal beatitudes. Those of you who were here last week, this is a little bit of a review, but it's critically important, and I would encourage you to perhaps write these down. Put your own words to them. You see, purpose, that's the reason, that's the need, that's the why. That's, wh that's why you're going to do the things you have to do. And you might have to eat some foods you don't necessarily like and you don't normally eat right now because you have a purpose, you have a need, you have a why to do it. There's a passion. Now, what comes from passion is commitment. You see, you can have a person, uh, a, a, a purpose. But if you're not really, really passionate about that purpose, when it gets tough, you quit. You just bail out. So this is where commitment comes from. Integrity is about change. It's about the need for change. It's about recognizing things. I don't. I really don't know. I don't know what to do in this situation. Integrity is first about being in integrity with yourself, saying, "Hey, hey, I've got a. I have a knowledge hole right here. I don't know what I would do in this situation." Well, then integrity says you need to change. Next thing is humility in this list, and that comes down to the quest for knowledge. Because if you're arrogant about things, you're going like, well, I know what to do. I'm not going to worry about that. You know, I'm okay. Um, that's lack of humility, and that'll get you in trouble. So it's the quest for knowledge. It's about understanding. And courage. When things get really tough, you know, people need to have courage. But it's not something you have. 
It's something you become because you have a purpose and you have a commitment to that purpose and it overshadows the fact that you may be terrified out of your mind and you have been willing to do whatever it takes. It goes right back to that purpose and that commitment. That re- See how these things, one flows into the other and it builds on each other? Discipline. Discipline, of course, is about work ethic. Discipline is about being able to hang in there and stay with it when it's really, really tough. Do the hard things because you have commitment and work longer than perhaps you want to. Uh, but that's the way that it is. It's about work, th- work ethic and that comes from discipline. Patience is critically important. And of course, that comes about because you're focused on the outcome, which is the purpose, the reason, the need, the why, the passion, all of these things, which comes from commitment. So you're just going like, all right, whatever it takes, I will simply do it. And then at the bottom of the list, this thing about forgiveness. And here's something that's very important about forgiveness. We're going to define that really. It comes from love. If you're you know, able to forgive, if you can let go, if you're not going to be focused on this problem that has happened, trying to blame somebody for it, what happens is you let go of anger. Anger is one of the big killers of people. Anger will eat you up from the inside. It will destroy you. You will get sick if you're angry inside, if you're angry about the situation. The other thing that happens, there's kind of two extreme emotional ends of the spectrum. One is anger which turns to rage. When you go from anger into rage, that becomes deadly. Rage is deadly. The other one is a discouragement that turns into deep, morbid depression, and depression will kill you. So all of these things go together, and they all focus back to purpose, the reason, the need, the why, the passion, these kinds of things. And the reason I talk about this in what we might think of as a cooking class is, well, You see, you need to internalize these things and they become part of your attributes. Otherwise, you get frustrated, you get angry. It's like, I don't like this food. I don't want to have to fix it this way. I'm just not going to do this. Well, yeah, you've got a problem when it goes that way. And that's what's going to happen to a lot of people, unfortunately. People who feel entitled to have all the wonderful things that we've had, when they're taken away from them for whatever reason, from them individually, or the community as a whole, or the world as a whole, people will just quit. They will give up because they don't possess these attributes. And you can use different words. Please define them the way that works for you. But I believe in one form or another, another, every one of those attributes needs to be inside of you. All right. The key immediate beatitudes for survival cooking in this case, I didn't change that from gardening from last week, is integrity which is about change. It's all, and, and this is where this idea of change comes from and the need that comes from. There's no doubt that tomorrow will come. There's no dispute that things happen. But how you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you're prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. That's why I decided to talk about how you're going to fix meals six months after the, the utilities have all been gone and they, you don't know when they're coming back. Maybe they're going to be back tomorrow. Maybe it's next year. Maybe it's next decade. We don't know. Now, I hope that doesn't happen. I don't want it to happen, but I want to be prepared to deal with it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on it, and I'm certainly not going to wring my hands over and say, oh, golly, what am I going to do? Well, the reason I won't do that is because I know what I am going to do. I hope I can help you understand what to do. Integrity leads to change. Humility leads to a quest for knowledge. Knowledge, in this case, we were talking about the true needs of the body. Because that's what it really comes down. When we're talking about cooking and fixing meals and meal planning and things like that, really, it's all about the needs of the body and taking care of them. It's not the needs of the tongue or the smell or the eye. It's what does, the, what does every cell in my body need to have. So ultimately, it's about nutrition because you and I, we become what we eat and drink. And it's important that we eat and drink the right things all the time. Well, some ref- some principle-based classes we can talk about for correct nutrition. There's Nutrition Class 5101, Nutrition for Health and Strength During Disasters, 5201, the Nutrition Library you must have, uh, 5105, Long-Term Storage Foods. And that's such an important one. In fact, we're kind of talking about those things tonight. And then Basic Foods, how to buy, store, and use them and getting experiences with grid-down recipes. And that's kind of what this class is about. 
And, but I'm not focusing so much on the recipes, but the philosophy, the feel, the idea, those kinds of things. Now, there's some wonderful books available in these areas, but these books have a problem. In fact, here's some great books, but they're not going to help you really fix your meals when you've been without any of the utilities for six months or so. Uh, if you're trying to do it the way you've always done things, because you don't have them. If I was looking at my nutrition library and we're wanting to learn about the critical nature of nutrition, then these three, one of them's a DVD on the left, Food Matters, get that online at foodmatters.com, uh, uh, or maybe it's net or uh, org, I'm not sure, but anyway, you can look it up and find it. Get that DVD, and that's a good eye-opening DVD. There's The Maker's Diet, which is another interesting one. Uh, the book, Truly Cultured. And we're not talking about cultured as in we're refined, but we're talking about the foods that are cultured. There's a lot of fundamental nutritional information in those. And there's other good books, by the way. Uh, find them, but understand the principles. It's not the recipe. It's the understanding what you're looking for because you may not be able to find the things that fit in your recipe. Well, as I talk about in other classes, there's four food categories, expedient foods, convenient foods, long-term storage foods, and then future foods. Well, future foods, that's gardening and renewable. You've got to be able to do that if you're going to be self-reliant. Expedient foods are things that you can just eat immediately. You don't have to do anything with them. <clears throat> I have a picture of an expedient food that I had for breakfast this morning a little later in the program. You know, open a can of something and eat it. That's all you have to do. Convenience foods, we're going to talk something about convenience foods too because we have some wonderful ones available. Usually that's just like add some hot water, bring it to a boil, let it simmer, or sprout it. Those are convenience foods. They, they're not instantaneous, but they don't take very long. And then we have our long-term storage foods, the ones that you'll also want to have. When we took a, take a look at the uh, food groups, there's five of them. Live foods, sleeping foods, dying foods, dead foods, and deadly foods. Avoid the dead foods. You'll learn about those in the nutrition classes. We're wanting to stay as close as we can to live and sleeping as much as possible. Some of the foods, as they're um, aging a little bit, or as we may be cooking them at too high of a temperature, they're going to be dying, and then they end up dead. Things that have been pasteurized, basically dead. They're not deadly. They're just missing some of the nutrients we'd like to have. Well, they come in a variety of forms like this, and some of them are things that are, I'll say, pre-prepared and combined. Read the ingredients is what you want to do. I do that because most of these prepared storage foods are scary. Uh, some of the, If you can't pronounce it, why would you eat it? Uh, if you don't know where it came from or understand which test tube it came out of, why would you eat it? There's spices and herbs and different things like this. Again, more information in other classes. These are things you'd use. But in these long-term storage areas, it is the legumes and beans, the grains that come from grasses and some of the seeds are some of the main things because many of these will store for extended periods of time. You might have the other convenient foods and you might have other foods that uh, don't have as long a shelf life, but you want to have things that have very long shelf life. Legumes and grains do generally have very long shelf lives. In the legumes area, there's a long list of them. Most of them, because they have a low oil content, will store quite long. Peanuts and soybeans uh, don't store real long because of the oil content that's in them unless you do something to help them store longer, put them in a vacuum, put them in a freezer, then they will store longer. More information other classes, they, they look like this. And, and, but the thing that's wonderful about these, of course, is you can replenish and grow your own. That's what we've been doing in the programs with Carol Depp, which will be publishing a whole series of those that go along with her book because uh, beans are a wonderful source of nutrition you can uh, re replenish. And there's such a variety of them, it's great. You have the cereal grains, the, the barleys and the rice and the wheat and triliquets. Some of these have very long shelf life. Some of them don't store as long again because of the amount of oil they may have in the germ and or the, the covering, the husk that's over top of them. Wheat is one of those that will store for a very long period of time, or millet uh, stores for long periods of time. These are very common. You need, and see, the reason I want to touch on this, when we're talking about slam, bam, down and dirty, you know, shoot from the hip kinds of nutrition, you might be, you may have eaten up all the stuff you love to eat. All the stuff in the freezer is gone. All the canned goods are gone. All the prepackaged meals that are all put together, you add hot water to, they're all gone. And now what do you have? A bunch of long-term storage foods, which you're going to be grateful to have. But if your attitude is one, I don't want to eat these things, I don't like them, you could have a problem. And that's where learning to use them now is so important. Play with them, have fun with them. That's part of what I'll be doing on Saturday. 
that we're going to do our best to see if we can film that and we can give you even more information that will be available of what this looks like rather than just the theory and the concepts I'm sharing with you now. You know, things like oats. Oats are a great food. They're a little hard to, to grow yourself because of that tough husk on there, but oats are a wonderful thing to have. Rice is another great one to have. Unfortunately, brown rice doesn't store very long. Unless it's in a vacuum in the freezer, it does pretty good. So usually we end up storing uh, white rice if it's going to be on the shelf. But that's not nearly as nutritious as kind of the bottom line. Um, and it looks like this. This is the whole brown rice. Uh, millet is one of those really, it's actually a fun food. It's an ancient food and it's been used a great deal. And it's also great for somebody if they happen to be gluten intolerant uh, because there's no gluten in these. You also have uh, things like this, the sorghums. And some of these other grasses that produce these grains that we can use in a variety of ways. There's some pseudo grains out there that are really important to have, and you can grow these yourself amaranth, buckwheat, and quinoa. Excellent foods, and they're not grasses, so they're not true grains, but we treat them like grains. The thing that's great about the amaranth and quinoa in particular is that they have a full nutritional profile of the, um, the, uh, the protein uh, components, the amino acids that you'll want to have. This is amaranth, wonderful little grain. I've been growing it in small quantities for a number of years and reseeding it so that I have it getting established in my yard. Buckwheat, a great cover crop, by the way, and a great way to build soil. Uh, you can just use it in your garden to grow and then turn it under as a green manure. And then we have the quinoa, which is another one that cooks up very nicely and is great because of its nutritional profile. Well, seeds. Seeds are another important thing to consider. Uh, and be, primarily because of the essential fatty acids that are going to be in those seeds. That's what's important with them. They have high contents of oil. Now you have to be careful they don't store as long because of that oil content. Flax isn't too bad because it has a very tight shell on it, but it's best to be refrigerated and or frozen. Pumpkin seeds and, and sunflower seeds, again, you can freeze them or put them in a vacuum, but the great thing about them, they're actually easy to renew, so you can keep them coming. Uh, replenishing them yourself. Flax, golden flax, brown flax, pumpkin seeds uh, are a wonderful nutritious thing and they have such a nice uh, fatty acid profile, the lipids in them, and the sunflower, easy to grow, lots of oils. Now, key live foods that you can produce and store at home. We're talking about carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Squash, potatoes and the laying flock. If you've been listening to the programs with Carol Depp, if you have her book, which you should have, you're learning about these. And these are easy to renew and you can use them fresh. Some of the other things, the corn and those, you can store them, uh, but they're going to be used dry rather than fresh. The potatoes and the squash and the eggs are going to be fresh and vital and, uh, and they can taste delicious add to your, uh, and to your diet. Winter squashes in particular we think about because of being able to store them for several months into the winter. And if you do it carefully and you listen to what Carol has been teaching, you can get some of these squashes that go five, six months or longer. Potatoes, a wonderful crop to have. And what most people don't appreciate, and I didn't really because I wasn't paying attention to them, that they have a good protein profile also. Not, we think of them as a starchy food, but they've got good protein content and they're very resilient being able to go through drought and things like that. And then the laying flock for the fresh eggs. Eggs is what we're after first and foremost because of the omega-3s that are in the egg when you raise your own eggs and your own chickens. Um, and it's that egg that is so critical. And of course, the bird itself can be harvested uh, and used uh, as appropriately as you think it would be. But the eggs is the main thing that we're really, truly after here from those chickens. And then we have the garden vegetables. And this is for variety, flavor, the phytonutrients and the minerals. And there's a whole bunch of these things, but you don't necessarily have uh, enough of these at times so that you can, uh, uh, you know, make it your entire diet. And storing them, of course, can be an issue. Uh, but unless you dry them, things like green beans and green peas and herbs, I'll be using a bunch of those this coming Saturday. And I've just scrounged up a bunch of stuff I'm going to show you. Here's, here's, in fact, a lot of those are in those bottles I'll be taking to cook with. And I don't have a menu plan here. I just grab stuff that was laying around. I'm hauling them along, and we're going to build something out of them. This is what you must be able to do. If you have cookbook mentality saying, I have to have a cookbook, that's an okay place to start. 
but you need to get to the point where it's like you don't have to have a cookbook to do those things. Some of the tools and skills that you'll need to have. Now this is where we get right down to some of the nitty gritty in part of this. Um, and and, and what, you know, what's cooking about? Well, first off, it, it is a very important thing to have to help with your nutritional needs. You need to plan for cooking. And by the way, I absolutely believe that having live, fresh foods is the best way to go, as much as you possibly can. In fact, you know, some, some people will say, and some instructors and uh, writers and researchers say, at least 50% or more than 50% of your diet in something that's alive. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a fresh thing out of the garden for it to be alive. There are some things that can be stored for extended periods of time. That's where potatoes and squash and carrots and some of these that can store. And I'm still eating carrots from last fall when I harvest them. We've got a boatload of, car of uh, carrots. And I'll be using some of those since they came out of my garden this Saturday. But it, it is about taste in some cases. There are some foods that taste better or they taste differently. It's about variety because they taste one way when they're raw, they taste another way when they're cooked, and they add it when you blend them together. And appetite fatigue is one of those things to consider. One of the biggest reasons to look at uh, cooking of foods in some cases can be because of uh, safety. Some foods, they may be, have some toxins in them. There are some things in particular like tapioca. Don't eat raw tapioca. It's toxic until you cook it, and then you break down that toxin. There are some other things that are like that. You can also have pathogens that may be in or on the food, or in the case of something that may have been bottled, you know, perhaps it's a little bit, you know, you can't tell that it's way off. Uh, you know, if it's way off and you have an expanded lid or what have you, you know, throw that one out. That goes into the compost, back into the soil. But sometimes, if in doubt, you know, heat the food, cook it so that you're going to kill the critters that might be in there so you don't get sick. There's also some foods that need to be cooked to release their nutritional value. Amaranth is one of those. Amaranth eating eaten raw is not that great. It really should be cooked because there are some things that are not going to be released until they're heated and cooked uh, and or sprouted. Now sprouting is another way of doing those things. You can almost think of sprouting as being an alternate cooking way without any heat. Okay, lots of wonderful books. I have a library full of them. I get a lot of hints and ideas from them. You'll want to have them but every one of these books, even the ones that talk about cooking with food storage and using your food storage and those kinds of things, if you go through those books and you really think about it, they're not helping you understand how you're going to do this. Because they're written from the perspective of, well, you have heat. Uh, you have utilities. You have running water. You have lots of water to clean up with and things like this. It may not be that way after a few weeks or a few months. So basic tools and related supplies. Now again, there's some classes we went into greater depth than these, uh, so I won't spend a lot of time here. <coughs> but there's a variety of different appliances that we would use for heating. The one circled in red on the left, those are all liquid fuels, kerosene, alcohol, white gas, uh, kinds of appliances. Then we have the solid fuel ones circled in blue that would be uh, things that would burn wood or charcoal, the gaseous fuels, the propane, the butane, that's really, really handy. And then we have some alternative kinds of things using the sun, heat recovery, uh, or cutting down on the use of some of our fuels that you need to learn about. Those are, in fact, very important. There's some other tools you may want to have to be able to pre-process. These are important to have. And then the, the utensils and some of the things. I mean, the can opener, that's pretty basic and simple. I always have one with me. But... Uh, you know, you want to be able to get into your supplies. And then the fuels that go along with these things. All right, tools class 8101, 8211, 8212, all about different ways of doing these things. You can look at these classes. They come up. Some of them are online now. More will be in the future. And it's playing with these things now. And it's getting experience now so that you'll know how things work. And you need to make mistakes now while it's easy to fix them while it's not an issue and while your life isn't threatened you know it's like well I haven't been able to get one of these meals to work for two days well two days of fasting won't hurt you some of it you're going to play with in home in the house <coughs> it's get out some of these alternative appliances and just put them on the cooktop the stove and do a few things there so you know how they work how to take care of them and, and try some things differently and turn the you know the power off and play with it that way but one of the things I'd like to promote to you the concept 
is about using some of this cast iron cookware because of its utility. It's not the most convenient thing to use, and they are heavy, the Dutch ovens and some of the other cast iron ware. But one thing you can say about them, they're built like an anvil, and yeah, they weight about like an anvil too. Oh, they're ugly black. They look dirty all the time, and that's one of the reasons I hear some, I don't like to use those. They, they look so dirty. They're, they're black. You know, and they, they don't clean up and they don't shine. Well, we have an attitude issue right there. They do have a tight-fitting lid, and you can shove those things right in the fire if you need to. Uh, you can, you know, do this kind of cooking with some of your nice stainless steel pots that have the glass lids and the plastic handles on them. You know, that's not going to work out real well. So what the the uh, cast iron gives you is the capability to cook when you... <laughs> when everything else is not working, on the coals, on the flame, in a fire pit, or things like that. Or you can, of course, use them on uh, the stoves like I do all the time. This is my little survival kitchen. You see, it's out in my garage, and it's ugly out there. I don't have much counter space. It's a real pain to work with, but I'm out there cooking. Several times a week, I fix some meals out there. I try some different things so that it's it's kind of automatic. It's easy to do, and I'm playing with the... And, of course, I'm seasoning these uh, Dutch ovens and my uh, cast iron cookware. Some of them are well seasoned because we have some that are many decades old. I'm also experimenting with, and you want to experiment with, just how little energy can I use, particularly precious things like propane, different things that you can do to insulate them and use just a tiny little amount to get a meal fo fixed, and then other ways of conserving it. Well, down and dirty survival cooking, about thinking, and about actions. Uh, this was breakfast. Well, it was breakfast in the middle of the morning, almost about noon, because I got up and I've been working on this program. I had, like I said, early on, had a dickens of a time trying to figure out how to start this thing and how I would do it and what's different about this than others. And this Saturday, it'll be a lot easier to do because I'll just show people. So my breakfast was this, and what made me think about this, I've had, sometimes people will see me, I'll just open up a can of peas and I'll just eat it, or a can of green beans or something like that. And sometimes people say, like, oh, I could never do that. I eat, eat that cold food, I, I, I always want my food hot. And I'm like, why? After I eat it, it gets warm. Um, now, if there's a safety issue, you know, it needs to be heated. So there's not going to be a safety issue. But a can of pea or a can of green, they're cooked, they're pasteurized, they're essentially dead foods. Uh, but, um, you know, just open them, eat them. Oh, by the way, the spoon is optional. You know, you do it with a stick. Uh, I do that regularly with things. So, see, I'm talking attitude here. I'm talking outlook. I'm talking adaptability to things. Um, can opener is really handy to get open. I can open it with a knife blade if I have to. It's a little messier. So, if I have foods like that, I can just eat them is the bottom line. Y you play with doing other things. This is one that's it's a recent experiment. <clears throat> Uh, in that plastic dish on the left, that uh, a few weeks back was beef stew. It was a beef stew that we had cooked up in a big crock pot, crock pot. There was a whole bunch of it. And after a little while, eh, people didn't want to eat it anymore that way. So I took it and put it in the dehydrator, and I dried it. Dried it till it was hard and brittle. Then I took it to my hand mill. I do as much as I can with, by hand, so I'm getting experience with them. I took it to my hand uh, mill, uh, my grain mill. And I cranked it through there, and I had to put it through a few times. I'll tell you what, a, a cubed potato, after it's been cooked and then dehydrated, is about as hard as a marble. I mean, it's tough stuff. It was kind of fun doing that. So I had to pass it through a couple of times. I ground it into this meal. That was the second part of my breakfast this morning because it had already been cooked. I dehydrated. I ground it into this fine uh, fine meal. It's coarse uh, you know, flour. And I just add hot water to it, let it set, stir it up, and voila. It's done, and it's nice to add a little olive oil to it so that you have a little fresh of the, the fatty acids. That was breakfast, and I didn't waste anything, and I'm experimenting at the same time, gaining experience. This is what we mean by attitudes and about experimenting, about playing, and about trying things and doing them at home now so that when the time comes, you'll be more adaptable, more resilient, and you won't go like, oh, that was last month's beef stew. I don't want to eat that um, kind of thing. Well, this cast iron cookware, uh, these skillets, which are uh, wonderful, and that, m uh, that medium-sized one in the middle there, that's my favorite. I use that multiple times a week, sometimes several times a day. In fact, you look down in it, 
you look at that, and here's one of the objections that people have. They're going, well, that thing's all black. It doesn't look clean and shiny, and it's got all this, this, this baked on, cooked on, uh, that's carbon, by the way. As a matter of fact, it's very close to what you might call graphite. Graphite is something that things don't stick to. Uh, graphite uh, is non-toxic. Graphite is just a structure of uh, carbon is all that it is. This is kind of like desert patina on your rocks and things out there. It is the original non-stick surface. Uh, this thing should never be touched with detergent or with soap. Here's how I clean it. A steel spatula like that with a straight edge on it so I can just scrape it, scrape things out of it. Uh, and then wipe it out. Now, in some cases, there are things that kind of adhere a little bit to that carbon if something gets burned in there. If you were cooking meat in particular, the, uh, the, the fats, a little bit of that may stick to it. So you have this stuff that seems to be clinging to it. It's just a little bit of hot water in there, and then just scrape it with a spatula. It cleans right up. Now, this is important because you may not have a lot of water. In a shutdown situation, see right now our lifestyle is what? You just go to the tap, you turn it on, and you'll let it run for, you know, a minute and a half so you can get a cold drink of water, and you'll let it run for two minutes until the hot water comes out, and you're just pouring this water down the sink. When you're working out of stored water, out of bottles, by the way, that's what I'll be work using this Saturday when I do this class, but when you're using stored water that's precious, or you might be hauling it from a spring, or you might be having to process your rainwater or something like that. You don't have a lot of water to throw away. Sanitation is one of these things that's extremely important. How do you get your pots and pans clean? One of the advantages of the cast iron is that once you have them nicely polished, as this one is on the inside, there's not a rough surface. And the newer cast iron, when you buy it, it usually just has the sand cast finish on it. You may want to actually get a little buffing wheel uh, with the sandpaper on it and polish it out so it's nice and smooth like this skillet is because it's so easy to clean. It cures up beautifully. In fact, when we take a look at this a little bit closer down on the skillet, we look right in here. And here's this baked on, burnt on, black, wonderful non-stick carbon that's in there. You never scrub it out. You don't take a scrubber to it or anything like that. And you think, well, it's not sanitary. The heck, it's not sanitary. I heat that thing. You know, there's nothing that grows in. I, I wash it. I wipe it clean anyway, or may use a little hot water in it. A little closer look at it. You can see it here. That's a wonderful nonstick surface. It takes almost no oil or fat to be able to cook things like pancakes or other things. And once again, a little bit that sticks. It's easy to clean. And in a worst case scenario, if something really nasty was in there, you just use the old campfire burn it out trick, and you can burn the things out. I prefer not to do that because I can destroy that. Uh, that surface on there and I have to re-cure it, which has happened to the skillet once when it was accidentally left on the stove and got red hot, took all that black carbon off of it and we had to start again, but it's, it's come back and it's wonderful. Sanitary, not a cleaning issue, takes very little water to clean up. Now the same thing is going to happen with the, the Dutch ovens that you have, the other cast iron cookware. They are also very, very energy efficient to work with uh, the Dutch ovens. My uh, my kitchen that I'll be bringing with me, this is my survival kitchen that's out in my garage. I work in my garage because there's no counter space and it's ugly and it's cold in the winter. might be just like that shelter that you're in or somebody's basement or garage or that uh, building that you had to set up camp in or your tent or those kinds of things. So my garage is cold in the winter and it's hot in the summer and it's inconvenient and it's ugly and it's a surrounding that you just might have to work with. So get used to it. That's a part of doing these things so that you'll have an understanding of what it might be like. And it's like, well, this is no big deal. So I'll be bringing that little kitchen with me. We'll be using that. I have a couple of other appliances I'll bring also uh, to do the cooking and do the heating with. And then when I ran around, and this table has things that I'm bringing with me this uh, weekend. And again, there, there's not a recipe. It's not something that I can show you. This is what we're going to cook, and this is how you do it as a recipe. I just went and grabbed some stuff. And there's some strange things on that table. On the far right over there in that plastic thing with all the green stuff in it, that's some dried leaves. Uh, I, I think, I'm not sure what they are. I wouldn't have kept them if they were toxic. I'm pretty sure that they happen to be amaranth leaves that I've dried. Amaranth is wonderfully nutritious. We'll have some sprouts, and there's my cooking pots there. And yes, we have some tinned butter and cheese that's in storage. So I just threw it in here. I might use it. Those uh, stand-up bottles kind of in the back there. There's some uh, quinoa. There's some rice in there. And I don't even remember what the other one is. It's just things I grabbed off my cooking shelf that I have. 
there's some uh, split peas, uh, and I have some, uh, oh, some, uh, some comfrey. Com- we think of comfrey as you're going to make comfrey tea and a poultice and those things. Comfrey is a food, and you can use it as a food. So I have some dried comfrey that will grind in with some things there. Um, kind of in the middle, it's hard to see in the little plastic bags, I have some uh, uh, jerky powder. This is jerky that I ground into a powder. Uh, and then there's garden vegetables. You remember those vegetables I showed? I know I have some green beans, and I have some dried squash, and a few other things in there. Uh, there's some beef bouillon, some vegetable bouillon, my jugs of water, and my mills, and those kinds of things. I'm going to bring this stuff. We'll build a meal out of it. Now, this is, those of you that can attend, that are local can attend, this might be interesting, because I promise you, you'll probably see some things done you've never seen done before. You're not going to read about in a book. And you're also likely to eat some things you've never eaten before. Um, I promise you they, they'll be edible. Um, I don't know what they're going to taste like. Sometimes I make things, they're pretty tasty. It's kind of like, I hope I can recreate that. Other times it's kind of like, well, I ate that. Um, and it was okay. Uh, rarely do you have to throw anything out. Every now and then I've thrown out some things that were just so impalatable that I had a combination that didn't work. But that's why you do it now while it doesn't matter so and again I did this in the garage and I show an ugly old garage with things piled around in there because you might be working in a space like that if you have to have the the stainless steel sink and the marble countertop and the flowing water and all of the appliances and things right there and you say I can't cook any other way then it's going to be tough it's going to be difficult if this is about being adaptable this is what those be attitudes are all about is being able to think outside of the cookbook and outside of normal way that things are done that's what we'll be doing well you must also have options and backups you back up the backup with a backup is what it comes down to it's a way of thinking it's a way of thinking now it's it's some of your normal actions and some of your normal planning it's the what if what would i do here how would i do that in the future, you need to understand there will be very little things that will be trash. There's not much you throw away. Rotted food, that goes into the compost. You know, foods that are kind of left over that you didn't eat at dinner time, that's breakfast because you can't afford to throw it away. Um, sometimes I hear people say, oh, I, just, I never eat leftovers, I just won't do that. Well, okay. Uh, there may be a time when you need to do it, so you might want to eat your leftovers now. You know, I told you the story of that beef stew that was kind of getting left over. I dried it, ground it into a powder. I eat it now. It works just fine. You must have knowledge about things. You remember the, the little formula K equals I times E. It's about practicing now. It's about breaking things now. It's about making mistakes now. It's about learning to do things in the dark, in the cold. It's about developing habits and memory of how to do things right now so it's just not an issue for you in the future. You'll want to learn how to conserve fuels and how to stretch them out. And other classes we talk about this, the sun oven's a nice way to go. A pressure cooker is a great way to not use as much energy, it'll cook things faster. And then you can use the, the old straw box method, the wonder box cooker, whatever you want to call it, where you take that pressure cooker or your covered Dutch oven, because that's where it originally started, started, it needs to be a covered pot, and put it in an insulated container. Originally with straw, now it can be bean bags, uh, it can be newspaper and a cardboard box, works just fine too. But you'll need to learn how to stretch out those fuels because you may not be able to replenish them. And then we have the modern straw box, which is these thermos bottles that I use regularly, or the big thermos bottle that I'll be bringing, by the way, we'll use this one for one of our meals, where it goes inside that, that pot that you put on the stove that can be heated, bring things to a boil, then it goes inside of this insulated jacket, this Literally, it is a vacuum bottle that goes inside of let it set. So you just bring it to a boil. You don't have to sit there and let it simmer. You put it in an insulated container, whether it's a vacuum bottle or whether it's a box full of straw. It all works about the same. This is more efficient than a box full of straw. Thermal recovery we talked about, and that's if you're doing some lighting that produces heat, maybe you want to recover that heat and cook with it at the same time. Since you will be doing things with different appliances and different tools and different fuels you've got to learn to pay attention to the safety because as I've mentioned repeatedly previous generations had fire safety experience and training it was just a way of life now we are very inexperienced our, our grandparents lived with fire safety every single day they were thinking about it and they had their own set of problems the consequences of fire safety 
are no longer ingrained into our society. You can make simple little mistakes that burn your house down, burn your tent down, set your you know, RV on fire and things like that. You're going to have to pay careful, careful attention, in particular, watch children. Now, the loss of food supply and the utility infrastructure will not be a threat to you if, number one, this goes back to those Beatitudes I talked about. You are fully committed to self-reliant living. Number two, you have knowledge of your options. Remember what knowledge is? K equals I times E. That's knowledge is information multiplied by experience. This is not reading a book or listening to one of my webinars or watching one of my videos or anybody else's videos. This is about doing it. This is about playing with it. You have knowledge of proper tools, their operation and maintenance. Remember, knowledge is doing it, not just, you know, I got out the instruction manual and I read it. Well, use it, be sure that it works, and also, how quick is it going to break on you? Uh, and somebody, well, I don't want to use it because I might break it. Well, you better break it now when you can fix it or replace it than in the future when you have no options. You must have sufficient food in storage to get you through, get you going long enough to where you can grow things. It be a part of a true community, and building that is so critically important because you can't do it all. You, know, you have the ability to find and create needed resources. It's a part of your life. You do it now. I, I love scrounging and just finding things and figuring out. I fix a lot of things because it's like, I wonder if I can fix this. Sometimes I can, sometimes I cannot. You live the personal survival beatitudes. That list that I gave you before has to be a part of your life. And if it's not, when things get tough, then you become angry. And angry people die early. You currently produce and store lots of food. And it's important that you learn to produce these things. Hence the gardening classes that we have coming up and some new materials for you. We've been doing a lot on the uh, the Tuesday broadcast, but we'll be doing even more because being able to replenish your food is critically important. Remember these four food categories, expedient, convenient, long-term, future foods. We're going to be looking at some in a moment. The five food groups, live, sleeping, dying, dead, deadly, stay towards the top of that list. One of the things that you need to understand is if you haven't noticed, prices are going up. Uh, on the basics on everything and it's it's going to get worse is probably uh, unfortunately I hope it doesn't but it probably will one of the things that's available if you saw the newsletter that went out uh, we have going on through the expanded pantry these uh, new foods that are available from expanded pantry they're tremendous there's a spring sale that's going on right now the margin is really slim we want to get it in people's hands uh, and uh, help you enjoy some foods. These foods are quite unique. They're quite unique in that uh, when you read the label, what's in them, there is nothing artificial in them. It's all food. Uh, these are extraordinarily uh, delicious foods. In fact, I eat them regularly. I have some here that I've had some of them for several years of this particular variety. And I, it's good enough to eat as a meal. It's good enough to serve to a, a friend or family. You know, some of these food supplies that you buy, particularly the low-cost ones. You know, it's the bucket that has a year supply of food. Have you ever tried eating that stuff? Man, that is grim. That is really grim. This stuff is good. And by the way, this Saturday it will be served. Several of these uh, entrees and, and desserts will be served. Yes, you'll get to eat my food that I make. I know you don't have to just eat only that. We'll be sharing with you some of the expanded pantry uh, do you compare the price and compare the quality? It cannot be beat, I promise you. We've never lost, when there's been a taste test against other people's equivalent foods, we've never lost a taste challenge with this food. It's great. And by the way, in the year unit like this, there's some of the long-term storage foods. You'll need to be using them also, as well as these 10-minute quick meals, uh, such as you'll find in this pack right here. Refer to the email for details on pricing and those things. And if you didn't have the email, you came through another link or something, send a, uh, an email to info at safeharboralliance.com. That's info, I-N-F-O, at safeharboralliance.com. It will be picked up. And just ask for the information about the expanded pantry foods. We'll get it right to you. Uh, and uh, you can come by and we, we can ship them, but uh, of course save money, come by and pick them up this Saturday or make arrangements to be able to get them. The other thing that we have available that I'm promoting again is we have bulk of the wheat and we have bulk of the pinto beans. And these things are taking a huge jump in price. The pinto beans 
uh, have about doubled. Now we have things at the old price. We've got these things in on consignment, but the person that owns them is probably going to raise those prices real soon because you need to have money to replenish them and the prices have nearly doubled. Uh, these are some of those long-term storage foods that you'll want to have. They're available at a very good price at this time. Uh, place an order for them. Get information on them if you want. Well, we take a look at all this thing. We've been talking about tools, which is where the cooking is and these kinds of things. All these different classes and courses that we have, some of them online. You look at all the learning opportunities. My goodness, there's a long list of them, and I don't do everything. And so people say, must I have, do, and know all of this? And the reality is nobody individual can do this. No one household or family can do it all. That's why it's critically important that you build your community, your relationships with people around you. You see, survival is about outreach now. It's about cooperation. It's about community. It's about being able to help each other. Uh, now and in the future, we help each other by sharing information and ideas. In the, in the future, we may help each other by sharing some of our tools. I mean, not everybody has to own a tiller or a tractor. Not everybody has to have certain kinds of tools, but you need to have it within your community. Not everybody's going to know everything. Not everybody is an EMT, but it's really nice to have one in your community. So if something you know ugly happens, they've got some advanced training there. So building community is important. That is Foundation Class 1106 that will be coming up in the future. Will you live providently? Well, the choice is yours and mine. And if you make proper provisions in every area of your life, then you can face the future with hope, with confidence. You don't have to look and say, oh my goodness, I hope things don't really go bad because it's going to be tough. Well, you look at it this way. There is no doubt to, that tomorrow will come, and there is no dispute that things happen. But how you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you are prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. And I believe I would much rather have an adventure than a survival experience. I've tried survival experiences. They're pretty pathetic, let me tell you. It's tough. I don't want to go there. So preparedness is based on principles. And you see what I've been talking about, and the reason I'm having is such a difficult time to figure out how to teach this over the internet. Saturday it's not hard because it's just slam, bam, gram, grab stuff, cut, chop, put together, do this, taste this, throw in some more, this is what you do, and change your attitude about how you look at these things. That's easy to demonstrate. It's a little more difficult to show here, but I want you to understand the concept, the principles, because it's not about the things to have, and it's not about the stuff you store. It's about what's inside of you, about who you are, what you stand for. It's about your attitudes, about your beliefs, about your outlook, about your resilience. So play with this stuff. See, provident living is a lifestyle as far as I'm concerned. It's something you just do. And you have fun with, and you do strange things, and I do strange things. You should do some strange things just for fun. Sometimes they're tough. And by the way, you're going to want to listen. We're going to get it set up so we can do a debriefing uh, over the Internet for people that cannot travel uh, to the live classes that we do. We're going to be doing a debriefing on Snow College because this last Snow College that we had, it's a week and a half ago, was extraordinary because the conditions were extreme, extremely severe. If we had not been prepared the way we were prepared, we get hurt. Now, I'm, I'm not just talking suffer out there. You get injured. We were in extreme conditions, and I'm going to have one of the, the, the coolest lady in this whole thing is the one that had doing it for the first time, and it just barely got her clothing finished. It wasn't even quite finished. I mean, it was still putting pieces together. And she's the best one of all to talk about this as far as I'm concerned. And yes, we had some of our, I was going to use the word old timers. I mean, some of our regulars that have been out there before. You'll hear from all of them because that was, that was doing some of these weird things. But you do it because you know then you will be okay. That's why you play with this stuff and experiment now. Well, the mission is to reach and teach as many people as we can about these key concepts. And that's what we do. So free classes every week. Audio cast every Tuesday night, uh, and they, this series, and we've been doing series with them, and some of these will, many of these, well, all of them will be available in the future, and some of them will be edited together in compact programs with just intense, wonderful information that will be available. Wednesday nights, we have the internet video cast. 
You can attend live at Cabela's and then the free public video archive that's online right now. Go to the webcast, go to the past webcast. You can watch many things that are there and there is more that's coming and of course there is the newsletter that you can sign up for and that will keep you abreast of what is going on. So we encourage you to do that. Join us at Safe Harbor Alliance. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. I would encourage those of you that can to come this Saturday if you want to see what some really weird stuff's like. Um, and I'm trusting that it'll be tolerable to downright delicious. Sometimes it is. But again, I don't have a menu plan. I just grab stuff. Because you may find yourself in the situation where all you have is stuff. You just have things. But it's what's inside of you and it's your attitude and your approach that will let you to get by with that. You want to be using some of the recipe books and doing some things right now. I, I rarely, I, I use a recipe look, book to see what spices go along with this particular thing. What's commonly used with it? So I'll know what I might throw in there because sometimes nutmeg doesn't go with some things. And other times it's like you wouldn't think you'd use nutmeg. I mean, that's for cookies and baking or what have you. But sometimes it goes in other foods and it's delicious. So I'll, I'll look at some of these concepts so I'm not afraid to try some things. But um, that's why I encourage you to play with stuff right now, try out some of these things, and that's what I'll be doing this Saturday at our class. Slam bam, down and dirty, shoot from the hip, meal preparation, just in case you find you have to do that. <clears throat> do you try to have a fuel supply for a year worth of cooking? And the answer is absolutely yes. Now, <clears throat> that can be a challenge. But I, I want to have a fuel supply because if I'm going to be cooking, cooking implies heat. Uh, now, and there's a lot of different sources, and that's why in the, uh, the other cooking class and in the, uh, uh, the, the fuels class, I talk about all the variety because you want to have a variety. I have appliances that will run on kerosene, on alcohol, on white gas, gasoline, uh, charcoal, wood. And remember that the, the appliance will dictate what kind of fuel that goes with it, and the fuel will dictate what kind of appliance it has to go with. Those have to be married. And for safety reasons, you never, never, never cross-mix appliances and fuels. A, a device that runs on kerosene, if you put gasoline in it, you are going to die, and you're going to burn everything down around you. It's as simple as that. So you have to learn the rules. Um, and you, the, one of the reasons you want to have a variety of these appliances is that, uh, do, do I have a 10-year supply of fuel? Probably not. Do I have a five-year supply? I may not. Uh, do I have a two-year supply? Maybe, with some of them. Do I have a one-year supply? I'm pretty sure of that one. But the thing you have to notice is that there may be fuels that are available. They may have been stored or they may come back into the system. And there might be kerosene available. If you don't have anything that can use kerosene, you've got a problem. If everything uses white gas or charcoal, and you can get tons of, of kerosene, but you can't get the other things. You can't get propane anymore. Propane's a wonderful fuel. It's a great thing to so you store that. And one of the reasons we talk about the energy conservation and stretching it is, you know, propane is the most convenient, the easiest, the cleanest, and in most respects, the safest one to use, particularly indoors. But it's very, very much an artificial fuel. It comes out of a gas and oil well. It has to be refined and scrubbed and cleaned, pressurized, put into a tank, and then you have to go to that tank or it has to come to you. And so when our system isn't working well uh, or is completely broken, you won't be able to replenish your propane. So you want to stretch out the propane. There may be times when you're using propane, it's like, well, I'm cooking inside because there's a screaming blizzard outside and all my utilities are off, but I need to be inside to cook. Well, charcoal doesn't work well. Campfire doesn't work well in that situation. The rocket stove, the open rocket stove that's unvented, you can't use that inside. So you might save the propane for very specific conditions, and then when the weather's better and if you have things that have to go outside, you go outside. That's why it's also nice to have a wood-burning device, a stove or a cook stove or something like that. If you can, you put that in so you can stay inside. So a variety of appliances and a variety of fuels is what gives you the re resilience to adapt to what may be going on. So that's why, uh, that's why I do a variety of those things. I'd refer you back to the, to the class on fuels, which uh, is online. Uh, you can watch that. It's uh, posted there. And the uh, class on cooking and on tools, uh, these are there to give you some of these ideas and some of these options. So I hope that helps, uh, hope that helps Barbara with uh, that question uh, as much as practical. Now, you have to start from where you are.
somebody says, well, I can't afford to get a year's supply of propane right now. Well, that's fine. Uh, but if you can afford to get one of those 25-pound uh, bottles and get it filled up, that's great. You have to be miserly with it. Uh, eventually, maybe you have a 100-pound bottle, and so you now you have some more. Maybe eventually you get a one that's outside the house so that you can now have a two- or three- or a five-year supply. And if you're only using it for cooking and you're doing a lot of very careful uh, use of that propane, being very, very efficient with it, you could have a, a five or ten year supply of propane uh, if you're using it very carefully and only using it for the minimum amount of cooking. And, and that's where these variety of fuels and appliances come in so you can use whatever's appropriate at the time. So start using things um, and getting experience with them. The sun oven is another way of conserving fuels and we saw a picture of that when the when the sun is out and there's not a screaming wind blowing uh, going on out there, go outside and use your sun oven rather than using charcoal, natural gas, propane, or anything else. Just use that. So having these variety of appliances and the means to do the cooking when you have to cook, does everything have to be cooked? Of course not. You know, there's a lot of things, particularly in the summer, that you can eat raw just the way it is. And there's a lot of things that rather than cook, you prepare your foods. We'll be doing a class on this one. There's another way of, I'll say, quote-unquote, cooking the food, which is changing its form so you can use it, and that is called culturing it, fermenting it. That's another type of cooking that you want to do, where you're not actually heating these things. You allow the, uh, uh, the, the friendly bacteria to uh, ferment them. You do that with milk. That's what cheese is. You do that with vegetables, carrots, and beets. And, of course, everybody thinks of sauerkraut. By the way, I love sauerkraut, you know, cabbage. But you can do it with all kinds of other vegetables. And that's another way of both preserving and preparing foods that you can use. There's, there's other things like the natural leaven. We did a thing on Tuesdays on that. There's been a couple of those classes about natural leavening. Using these critters around us that will both preserve foods and or pre... Uh, people don't like this, but it's what it really is. It's pre-digested. That's sometimes what cooking is. It breaks things down so your body can use it. That's what sprouting is. It's pre-digesting it. It's changing it in a form. Uh, that's what the culturing does. It's turning it into a form that's actually more healthy for the body. So as much as possible, we eat things raw. We eat them fresh, um, and uh, which can be the sprouting and those kinds of things. And by the way, I'll have sprouts there this, uh, this Saturday also. Uh, so um, play with this stuff. It's fun. And, and by the way, the new thing that I'm adding in right now, I'm getting back into the chicken business uh, and experimenting with chickens because it's very important to have chickens and to have eggs. If you listened to last night's program with um, Caleb, uh, you heard about uh, his um, chickens and what he's been doing and how important they are to him and his family. Um, and so, um, you know, experiment with things. Let's see, a question we have here. Charcoal briquettes come in two types, those that need starter fluid and those that do not. Do they store equally well? Um, I'm going to tell you, I, I don't know for sure. I'm going to guess, okay? I'll tell you what I know and I'll tell you what I guess. It's going to depend on what the, the kind of starter that's in it, if it will in fact age. I don't know about that. Now, the only briquettes that I store are the ones that use, I don't use starter fluid to start them. Uh, that's too precious to use to start, you know, briquettes. I'll start them with paper, cardboard, something I was going to throw away, uh, and start them in a uh, little charcoal chimney to get them going uh, so that uh, I don't have to use a whole lot of fuel. You can use the, start, the you know, lighter fluid for them. That's kerosene is all it is. That's lamp oil. That's more important to use in other places. You can use it for lighting and things like that. So I'm going to start them uh, just with paper and cardboard, things like that. Uh, if they're using a paraffin, and I'd have to study them. I, I, I can't tell you for sure if they store equally well. Um, you know, store some for five years and then see. What I do know is things like matches, old matches, don't work as well. Uh, charcoal needs to be kept dry. Uh, if, you know, don't want moisture to get into it because it'll start to crumble and break apart. I'm also guessing perhaps some of these the starters that are in them. They may be paraffin-based. If it's paraffin-based, that won't hurt them. Uh, it may be some kind of a petroleum-based. But the thing I, I dislike about the both the starter fluid, uh, lighter fluid, and also about the, um, the ones that have something in them to get them going, it's probably really polluting, and it's probably giving off some fumes you really shouldn't be uh, breathing. 
Uh, charcoal is bad enough because it produces a huge amount of carbon monoxide. That's why you cannot use them inside. Uh, deadly dangerous to use uh, uh, charcoal inside because it produces even more carbon monoxide than white gas does. So um, I, I choose to store the ones that are just plain old basic charcoal brick hats. And oh, by the way, one of the other things that's in our supplies class in the future, you need to know how to make your own charcoal. You won't be making briquettes that are molded together that have a binder in them. You're just going to be making charcoal because it has many uses, not so much for cooking, but for other things. But it will work for cooking also. So I hope that answers that question uh, a little bit. Uh, keep them dry. I, I store my charcoal briquettes in their original bags that is uh, plastic lined and then put them inside of another container that seals up because moisture is the thing that will cause them to uh, age and break down over time. I've had some charcoal briquettes that are, oh, they must be 20 years old and they're just fine. Uh, but don't let them get wet. Keep them out of, the, out of any, keep them where they'll be high humid. Don't you put them in a crawl space under a house where the humidity may be high and things like that. Keep them dry. Well, any more questions that we have from anybody, I'd be glad to answer them. I, I hope that what I've done will give you a, an idea from the attitude and from the outlook and from the way that you think about these things. That's, that's all that I can do over the Internet right now. And uh, once we get this thing filmed and uh, I can take some more pictures of the action and what have you, we'll be able to post those things. And I do want to turn it into a video. Uh, a lot of people like to see how things are done, and uh, um, this is not your your Food Network cooking show, let me tell you. Um, I don't know, maybe it'd fall in line, but there's a program on what is the worst cooks in America. I, I don't know, maybe the weirdest cooks in America. We ought to start that. Why don't we have a contest that's the weirdest cooks in America that make the goofiest things from all kinds of strange stuff they find laying around? Uh, maybe that's the kind of a... A program we should do, but that, that's actually how you have to think. Um, and uh, you don't have to be any kind of a super expert about these things. You just need to play with it, try some things, make some mistakes now. Well, have yourself a good evening. If there's no questions, we'll sign off right now and we'll all go back to what we need to do. Me, I'm focused on Saturday because I still have to gather some more things together and get it all packed up so I can come. Have yourself a terrific evening. I will see you next week and as many of you as we can on this Saturday. And remember this special that's going on with the expanded pantry and these foods. Come on Saturday, come taste, and come get some of those things. You won't be sorry that you did because it's extraordinary food. It's convenient food. It's very nutritious, and it's very, very delicious. Have yourself a great evening. I will see you next week. This is Jim Phillips. Have a good evening. Good night.